At his office in New York, a renowned private tutor has developed a technique of teaching foreign languages that is sought after by the rich and famous. But who is the man behind the method? In More Than Words on BBC Radio 4 Now, Gwyneth Powell explores the life and work of Michel Thomas. I offered courses in the beginning and said, you can learn a language in six weeks. Well, it got shorter and shorter. And I teach now the language in three days. Shall I tell you what is achieved in three days? A solid, comprehensive knowledge of the entire structure of a language. There's a long waiting list for would-be students of Michel Thomas. In my own experience working with him intensively for three days, I had a really quite remarkable degree of competence in all of the tenses, as well as the moods, the imperative mood and the subjunctive mood, the present subjunctive, the past subjunctive, and this all without any attempt to memorize anything or write anything down. At the conclusion of this, um, there is a really intense motivation to continue learning. Stars of film, business and politics queue at Michel's door, willing to pay £15,000 for less than a week of his time. It's the nature of his voice. It's the authority that he conveys. You're in a situation where you're almost mesmerized. You feel as if you're in some kind of comfort zone with someone who is so e incredibly self-assured that you're going to succeed. But despite his success as a private tutor, the educational establishment is sceptical about his method. Frankly speaking, the notion that at the end of one of these courses you know the entire language and you can somehow start to communicate without any problems, I, I mean, I think that is just uh, not true, I'm afraid. Looking into Michel Thomas's past does throw a little light on the originality of his approach. But it's such a remarkable story that many people have found it as hard to believe as his results in the classroom. I think my first impression of Michel was this man's story uh, seems so unlikely that it was impossible to believe. Except when I left him, I was somehow very moved and inspired. And then I started looking into documents and background, and actually his life is more, I think, documented than most people's lives. The journalist and writer Christopher Robbins is Michelle's biographer. In 1933, the Jewish teenager Monjek Kroskov was living in Germany when Adolf Hitler came to power. In his long struggle to evade capture by the Nazis, he changed his name to Michelle Thomas, and his life was soon dominated by some of the bleakest events in European history, events that ended in a personal tragedy. He was at the liberation of Dachau concentration camp. So Michel started looking at lists. These were lists of survivors. They were just typed lists. They weren't even in alphabetical order, uh, just typed up. And he went to as many camps as he possibly could and just looked through lists, looking for a name, hoping that his family was on it. Um, his family was not on it. And then he heard later that they all went to Auschwitz, and so what he knows is his parents and his family, which is a large family, ended up in Auschwitz and um, never came out. By the time he discovered the tragic fate of his parents, Michel only owed his own survival to a series of miracles. He had first been forced to escape to France, but his safety was short-lived. And they experienced how quickly a free society democracy could disappear. France, la patrie des droits de l'homme, the fatherland of human rights. In no time, the French democracy was knocked over, replaced by Vichy dictatorship, working with Nazi Germany. Watching his fellow countrymen turning against him would later inspire him to work on his own method of language learning.
I think he f feels that education is the secret for these things not to happen again. And what, ha what had happened in Germany was that you had a system of education where you educated an elite and everybody else was, was uneducated. And what happens there is when the elite suddenly are kicked away, you've got this enormous pool of thugs to run the place. And I think he feels that education is the answer. I mean, I, I don't know if he's right, but uh, any system that allows that is going to alarm Michelle Thomas or anybody who's been through it. Michelle lived a dangerous life in contact with the resistance in Vichy, France. But eventually he was arrested and forced to endure starvation in a concentration camp close to the Pyrenees. The horror of slave labour at a coal mine camp in Provence was to follow. But he faced the biggest fight of his life when Vichy France began transporting Jews to their death in Nazi concentration camps. Michel was sent, along with twelve resistance fighters, to the deportation camp of Les Milles, near Marseille, where he watched as his comrades lost the fight for their lives. As time went on, something happened, because it happened to me, so I could understand it. Somebody who was sentenced to death, who was expecting now to be executed, maybe next week. In a way, he's preparing himself. And at that point, somehow nature takes over. To me, it is like, like an all-embracing anesthetics. It, it embraces you. It takes over. You're losing yourself into that embrace, which means those who are in, sentenced to ex execution, to go to, to execution, they're not there anymore. They're gone. Nature has taken care of it. You see, all my friends were gone. I mean, they were gone before they were gone. I couldn't have more and more, I mean, not all at the same time, but I could, I tried, those who, who were not gone yet, I tried to hold on to them, yes, or for them to hold on to me. I couldn't. The constant, constant, biggest, biggest fight which I had was never to give in, not for a moment, because a moment would have been forever. That moment of giving in to the constant lure, and I'm talking here about the lure of embrace, and this is how I feel. This is how I felt. And I knew that the, just to give in for a moment, I would not be able to come out of it because I saw it with my friends. None of them did. He didn't give up something in him. I, th I think it's a stubbornness, an arrogance, an egocentricity. It's, not, it's all of these things that go together to fight. It, it, Michel saw it as a one-on-one -on -one between him and Adolf Hitler, and in a way it was. You know, it was these people were trying to kill him and Adolf Hitler was the symbol. And I don't think he ever lost faith that he could win, that he could triumph. I think I would have given up and thought the world's not worth living in. This is appalling place. He didn't, and he kept going. Incredibly, by hiding in the camp, Michel avoided two deportations. And one night he made a daring escape to join the secret army of the resistance. He would never forget the horrors he had witnessed at Les Milles. Men, women and children were loaded into those cattle cars where they didn't have enough room to sit even. And I will never ever forget dragging away in one, in one case 
dragging away the little children out of the arms of their mothers. It's very emotionally difficult for me even to talk about it. I think he feels it's incredibly important that somebody stands up. All right, we've, we've, we've read numerous Holocaust accounts and so on. But the important thing about, I think, Michelle Thomas's story is that here's somebody who was not prepared to be a victim, doesn't want to be identified as a victim. That's not to denigrate victims who've been appallingly treated. It's just that he doesn't feel he was. So he feels that when you just talk about victims, it's a way of just getting rid of them, brushing them under the carpet and just moving on. He insists that we remember and insists that we take responsibility for what we did and didn't do. And, uh, you know, he goes on about the Evian Conference when the Western world before the war got together to decide how many Jewish refugees they were going to let in and came up with a grand total of zero. Um, that is a disgrace, you know. Now, you know, you want to think that, oh, well, we were good, were good guys. Michelle Thomas is always there to remind you that perhaps you weren't quite as good as you thought you were. Because all this happened. And I'm sorry if I cannot keep my voice calm. Because all this happened under the very eyes, noses and ears of the United States government, of the United States Embassy, was the United States Embassy consulates not far away in Marseille, knowing what was going on and doing nothing. I'm sorry. He can show enormous rage and anger today. Of course, it's not directed against the interviewer, but it makes you very uncomfortable. And I think there's a strange emotional uh, vividness to his memory that doesn't let it go that keeps it there. And I think there's a enormous rage and enormous sadness in him, which he has to tamp down at all times.